Hello, in today's video, we are going to be talking about and running through the condition two menu from the Agoscu method of health through motion. So this is Pete Agoscu's first book that he wrote in the 1990s. And if you've read the book before, you will know that there is a condition one menu, a condition two menu and a condition three menu. I've already done videos on condition one and condition three, and today we're on to condition two. So as before, as in the other videos, I thought I would just run through a little bit of the theory of what a condition two is and try and explain how you can be a condition two as well as being one of the other condition postures. So a condition two posture is basically somebody who has something going on on one side of their body that they don't have going on on the other side of the body. So it's like asymmetry. Um, most of the time we're talking about rotation. So that might be the pelvis twisting forward on one side, or it might be the thoracic spine twisting forward on one side like that. So you can see that I've kind of got this corkscrew going on through my mid back. I'm twisted forwards like that. That could be combined with some pelvic rotation at the same time, or I might be rotated this way through my pelvis and twisted this way through my thoracic spine. So I'm like a full corkscrew through my body. Um, so yeah, so condition two is normally rotation, but it might be elevation of the pelvis, of the hip on one side of the pelvis. It could be elevation of the shoulder. It's just when there is something happening on the left-hand side that's not happening on the right hand side and most people will have this happening so most people are going to be some element or somewhere on a spectrum of being a condition two because our lifestyles are generally so dominant on one side you know if you're right-handed you probably dominate with that right hand side and therefore you lead more with that right hand which is like forming this kind of twist through upper body so many sports are one-sided again like tennis golf something like that. If you're doing the same motion over and over again on one side and you're not repeating it on the other side, you're going to build this kind of imbalance from side to side. Good example for the pelvis is how you drive your car because there's going to be something different going on from leg to leg. If you do lots and lots of driving, that might get imprinted in your posture. If you cross your legs the same way every single day, that might twist your pelvis in a certain way to make you um, lopsided. So being lopsided is very, very common. Being rotated is very, very common. And the way that the Agoski method works is that before we want to tackle anything else, we want to get rid of the rotation in the body. So if you identify as being a condition two person, if you know that you've got rotation going on or you know that you've got something very different happening from side to side in your body, you want to bring your body out of this rotation and get your body kind of more neutral and equal from side to side before you then start upping the load, putting extra gravity through your joints and building strength into this wonkiness. We don't want to build strength into wonkiness. We need to get you out of the wonkiness and then start building the strength into your body. So that's a condition two. And as I touched upon at the beginning, it is possible to be a condition two and a condition one. And it's also possible to be a condition two and a condition three posture, but it's not possible to be a condition one and a condition three posture. So the condition one posture is when you are an anterior pelvic tilt. So you've got this um, sort of, you're, you know, you're being tugged down through sort of tight, overactive hip flexors. You've got the front of your pelvis is much lower than the back of your pelvis and you have this arch in your lower back. This is a condition one person. Condition three person is the opposite of that. So the back of their pelvis is lower than the front of their pelvis and they generally have a very flat lower back and a flat sort of pancake bum as well. So you can be condition one, you can be anterior and also be rotated and different from side to side. You can also be condition three, posterior and also rotated, rotated from side to side, but you can't be condition one and condition three because they are opposite ends of the pelvic spectrum. You may, and this is where it maybe gets a bit complicated, you may well have something different going on from side to side of your pelvis. So it is perfectly common, and I have this, 
to have your pelvic tilt doing something different from side to side. So I am a bit anterior on my right hand side and a bit posterior on my left hand side, but that doesn't make me a condition one and a condition three, it makes me a condition two because it's that disparity from side to side. So I hope that kind of make things makes things clear for you. But to be honest, if in any doubt, I would probably just assume that you are a condition two work on the rotation to start with and then hopefully once you've worked on the rotation you might start understanding a little bit more as to whether or not you're a condition one or a condition three as well most people are rotated and most people have something different from side to side so today's menu we're going to be working on a bunch of different exercises from this book read it if you haven't already which are looking to eliminate rotation through the body in whatever form that might take before we get started with the exercises, I'm going to do my normal kind of health and safety thing, um, which is these exercises are designed to take away your pain. And pain is different to hard work, muscular burn, wobble, cramp, stretching, effort. All of those things are good and it's telling you that you're challenging your body in a kind of alien way. So it's a bit confused. It doesn't quite know how to react. Those are all good. Do more of those things. If any of the exercises in this routine feel bad for you and aggravate your normal symptoms of pain, do not continue to do the exercise. This is not a bespoke menu for you. This is a generic menu out of the book, which makes a lot of sense, but everyone's body is different. Um, and if you push through pain whilst you're doing an exercise, you're going to feel worse afterwards. So it's really not gonna serve the purpose of taking the pain away. You would be surprised at how often I have to like lay that on thick because people get told their whole lives like no pain, no gain, that's rubbish. If you push yourself through pain, you're going to be in more pain. We don't want that. We're trying to teach your body how to calm down and move better, not get more and more angry at you for doing things that it doesn't want you to do at this point in time. So go through the menu with me, enjoy it, Try your hand at anything, just like honestly, give anything a go and see what works for you. But if at any point you feel like, oh, actually, my symptoms of normal pain are getting worse and worse the more I do this, stop right there. That's your body telling you that it's not functional enough to do that movement. It's compensating and you're in pain. You can't comp your, compensate your way out of the problem. You just create more of an issue. We are looking for functional movement, not for compensation. So bear that in mind. Give everything a go. I'm not going to be held responsible because you fail to listen to your body when you do these exercises. You need to take responsibility for how you feel as an individual and stop things that don't suit you. So with all that in mind... I hope you enjoy. As I said, give it a go, stop if it hurts, and let's start our condition two menu. So the first exercise that we have on the condition two menu is exactly the same as the first exercise on the condition one and the condition three menus that I've already run through before. So the reason being is that just because we have these postural deviations that are on different ends of the scale, it doesn't mean that certain exercises don't work for, I'm not making any sense, but your some of the exercises work regardless of what your posture is, and that's because it's going after slightly different things. So we're going to be doing the arm circles today, and the reason that we're going to be doing the arm circles today is a little bit less about the shoulder position, and it's more about reducing rotation through the body, because arm circles are very good at waking up the muscles on either side of the spine, which is going to take a body that's twisting forwards thoracically into a more aligned position from side to side. So standing arm circles, I'm going to do one set of 40 reps facing the camera, and then I'm gonna to turn to the side so you can see what I look like from the side as well. We are standing hip width apart. Hip width apart is much narrower than most people think. And you're going to stand slightly pigeon toed. So you want your toes slightly closer together than your ankles are, because this is gonna change what happens at the hip. You are going to do golfer's grip. If you don't know what golfer's grip is, watch my video on golfer's grip to make sure that you're doing it correctly. It's not a fist. You are keeping your hands really active in golfer's grip throughout this exercise. You're going to take your hands up to shoulder height. So you're watching that they're even out of your shoulders from side to side and the thumbs are facing forward. 
My arms are straight and they're going to remain rigid and straight throughout this exercise. So no floppy kind of wrists or floppy elbows in this. The arms are rigid and straight. You are squeezing your shoulder blades back and down behind you using the muscles of the shoulder blade, not by flaring your ribs. So when I show you from the side, I'll show you what I mean by this. And keeping that tension through your shoulder blades, because you want your shoulder blades to be the thing that's working here, standing up nice and tall and straight, we're going to do 40 circles forwards from that shoulder blade area. So don't go too fast, but don't go too slow. You're trying to get some good momentum and you're trying to keep your hands circumnavigating that shoulder girdle. So don't get tired and let the hands slip further forward of your body. So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. I'm going to do 40 reps forwards and 40 reps backwards, but if you feel like you're losing form or you get neck tension or you don't feel like your body is able to do the 40 reps forward yet, stop at a level that feels right to you. So this goes through everything that we do today. I'm going to give you a set amount of reps or a set amount of time, but you're the expert of your own body. You're the boss of your own body. You do what feels right for you, and I would rather you be doing the exercises properly, but doing less of them, e.g. doing them functionally, rather than getting tired, losing form, maybe like hunching through your shoulders in this instance, and therefore you're compensating, you're not doing the exercise correctly. So that was our forwards, and then I'm going to show you from the side, this is a little bit more difficult for me because I've only got one arm because I'm close to the wall, but you'll obviously be doing it with both arms. For, the, uh, for this exercise. So still standing hip width apart, slightly pigeon toed. You can see here that my hips are nicely lined up over my ankles. I don't have bent knees. I'm not doing sway back. My hips are back over my ankles in a nice straight line. I'm doing exactly the same thing. So I'm taking both arms out to the side, trying to keep them circumnavigating the shoulder girdle rather than as I get tired, like flopping down and forwards like this, just do as many as you can, keeping in that shoulder girdle. The reason I'm showing you this from the side is that when people squeeze their shoulder blades back and down, it's very common for them to flare their rib cage upwards. So this is the back compensating for a lack of mobility through the shoulders and the thoracic spine. We don't want you dunking into your mid back here. You're thinking of keeping the rib cage down, the rib cage stays still, squeeze the shoulders back and down behind you. This time we're taking the thumbs to the back so that they're facing backwards, and we're going to do 40 reps or however many you can cope with backwards in circles around the shoulder. So off we go. The arms stay nice and straight and still and strong. And we're doing external rotation of the shoulder this time around. So 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So that is standing arm circles, exercise number one on our condition two menu. So for this exercise walkthrough, um, gravity drop, you are having a grand tour of my house because for gravity drop, you need some form of stair basically. And that is because we are going to have our ankles hanging off the back of a stair and this is going to realign our body starting at the bottom, working all the way up to the top. It's a great exercise, but you do need a stair and also something to hold on to as well. So this will make a bit more sense. I'm gonna try and show you this from as many angles as possible to get the setup right for you. But I, oh, hello. I have got um, a sort of inner banister thing here and I've also got this door frame that I like to hang on to as I do this exercise. So I'm gonna walk you through this. We're gonna do a couple of different angles so that you can see the various things going on. To start with, you might not see my face, but I'm gonna show you my feet first and then we'll sort of track up the body and make sure I've shown you everything. And my cat may or may not be doing acrobatics around me at the same time. So in the Agoscu books and in the software, they say to do gravity drop with trainers on. And if you want to, that's absolutely fine. Feel free to put trainers on because it might just make you feel a bit more steady and a bit more grippy. Personally, 
I don't like to have trainers on. I like to spend as much time barefoot and I really like the stretch that this gives my um, ankles. But, you know, do what feels right to you and wearing shoes is absolutely fine. I'm going to apologise for my cat, but I'm not going to change anything because the, otherwise they just scratch and meow at me. So there's no point. So for gravity drop, the first thing that you're going to do is you are going to stand with the balls of your feet on a stair and you are looking to keep your feet parallel. So you don't want your toes, Patsy, you're not being very helpful. You don't want your toes out to the side like Charlie Chaplin. You're really trying to make... <laughs> You're really trying to keep your ankles directly behind where those toes are. So can you see there that I'm nice and parallel at my feet? My toes aren't poking out to the side. You're looking for more than half of your foot to be dangling off the back of the step. And this is going to be giving you a nice stretch in your calves. So don't have your heels too close to the edge of the step. It really should be like the ball of your foot that is hanging off the step and you're making sure that you keep those feet active throughout and that you feel like you're kind of pinned down through the big toe joint as well. Now, this I will track up my body so you can see what I'm doing. The most important thing in this exercise, and you can see here by the way that I'm holding onto this wall with my hand and I've got my other hand on my banister, this is why you need something to kind of grip onto. You are letting your weight hang backwards so that your bottom is directly over your heels. So you will probably feel that when you're doing this, I'll show you from this side actually, that might be a good way of doing it. As you put your weight back into your heels, you might be starting to do that with your pelvis. So the pelvis comes forward and that's not what we want. So we want you to be trying to take your pelvis back over the ankles and that's gonna be doing the stretch that we want to happen. So this is why having something to lean onto is useful because you can allow your body weight to kind of slip backwards slightly so that you really feel that your pelvis is above your um, heels, your knees are straight, you're going to squeeze your quads, your thigh bones, sorry, your thigh bones, your thigh muscles, and you're gonna hold this for up to three minutes. You're trying to keep your shoulders above your pelvis as well. And basically we're just restacking all the low joints in your body. There should be a deep stretch going through your calves and possibly your hamstrings. And squeezing the quads is also going to help wake up those leg muscles and pull your pelvis into the same position from side to side. So when I do this, I'm very aware of the fact that my right side of my pelvis wants to twist forwards because that's what my body normally does. And I've got to try and control my pelvis so that the twist doesn't occur. I'm really trying to keep myself straight rather than letting my body compensate in the way that it wants to compensate. So I'm gonna count myself down 60 seconds here and then I'm gonna swap views so that you can see it from a different viewpoint. So off we go. So 60, I'm making sure that my weight is back over my heels. It's gonna put a nice arch in my lower back stretch down the back of my legs and I'm squeezing my quads and trying to stop myself from doing that twist, shoulders over hips. I am starting to count by the way in my head, uh, but I haven't started counting yet. At the same time, if you want to and if you can with your setup, see if you can squeeze, hold and release your shoulder blades back and down behind you. So your shoulder blades, your scapula, you can try and squeeze, hold and release them away from your shoulders and do reps at the same time that you're holding the gravity drop. For me, it's a little bit difficult with my setup because of where my hands are, but if you can do that, that will get, give you a little bit of movement through your scapula and shoulder blades as well. So I'm gonna start myself counting now. There's lots of funny stuff going on through my left leg. So my right side of my body compensates for my left leg, which is a bit lazier. So in this one, I always get funny things going on and it feels really, really nice. Squeezing my quads and I'm gonna do another 45 seconds because I've been talking this whole time. Remember, you can squeeze your scapula, your shoulder blades back and down behind you at the same time. So 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, squeeze the quads, 40, stop the rotation happening through your pelvis if you're anything like me, uh, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31. Now my feet are trying to turn, so I'm gonna just make sure that my heels are still level with my toes and that I'm not averting my feet and poking the toes out to the side. So you're gonna probably feel your body fight you in all these different ways. 20, 19, 18, 
17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So this is almost impossible to show you from different angles, but what I'm gonna try and show you from this side is that my weight is back down in my heels and that my pelvis and my shoulders are also back over my heels as well. So the pelvis isn't bailing forwards. I really don't know how much of this you're gonna be able to see. I'm only gonna do it for like 10 or 15 seconds or so, but I just thought it might be helpful to see it from this side. So I'm gonna try and keep myself to the edge so you can see. My feet are parallel, ankles hanging off the side, and you'll see that you'll probably notice that your body like wants you to do this. It wants to sort of shove the pelvis forward so that it's in front of the ankles. You've got to try and keep the pelvis back over your ankles as you squeeze your quads and hold your body weight backwards. Shoulders over pelvis, pelvis over ankles. And watch that as you go through this exercise, the toes don't start creeping out to the, out and the, the outside like this at Charlie Chaplin. You've got to try and keep your heels in the middle of all of your toes. So I'll just hold this for 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So here I'm going to show you how to do downward dog. So downward dog is a really, really common yoga pose and it might be a move that you do almost every day if you do yoga every day but it's very very difficult to get downward dog correctly done so i have been wrestling with my own downward dog for the last two and a half years since i started doing yoga and i think i'm only just starting to crack it now it's taken me ages but i'm finally able to get my pelvis into extension which is the crux of what this move is all about. So I'm going to walk you through a bunch of different cues for downward dog. To be honest, it's not one that I give to that many of my clients because it's a really, really difficult exercise to do. There's lots and lots of stuff going on and it requires a lot of function through the body in order to be able to do this properly. So the first thing I want to say is that I'm gonna show you this from the, this side, but I'm gonna just show you something from the front so you can see what we're going after with the legs. And I'm sorry, I might, you might have a bit of an unladylike view at my top, so I'm going to try and protect my modesty there. So, downward dog is this type of position, and I'll show you this obviously from the side, but I want you to look at your legs when you're doing this movement. So can you see that? My feet are straight, my toes are straight out of my ankle, they're not doing this or vice versa. My ankles and my toes are in a nice straight line. My knees are directly out of my ankles and my knees are leading into my hips. My legs are not collapsing in like this or like that, whatever it might be that you want to do. You're really looking for a nice straight line through your legs throughout this exercise. I see a lot of people who want to kind of bow in through their knees and collapse through their ankles, which just, there's no point in them doing that if that's what they're doing because they're not keeping this sort of, uh, they're not keeping the momentum going through their whole leg, they're collapsing through the lower portion of the chain, which there's no point. So that's what you're looking for if someone was looking at you from the front view. And the way that I like to instruct downward dog is I like to get people onto their hands and knees to start with, and I want you to roll an arch into your lower back. So this is putting your pelvis into extension. And this is how your pelvis should stay throughout the downward dog exercise. But you'll see that most people tuck their pelvis under and round their spine when they get up to the top. So I'll show you how this looks when it's done wrong. So I'm getting myself up. I'm desperately trying to put my feet on the floor. Um, and look, can you see there that I've got that rounding through my spine and my pelvis is actually tucking under. I'm not doing this. So rolling an arch in your back. Can you see that I've got that divvy in my back there? You're trying to keep that there, maintain that pelvic position as you try and straighten your legs. And that looks quite different because it means that the spine goes straight rather than this, okay? So that's a very, very common cheat is that you see people where their pelvis is actually just tucked under in flexion and the spine is flexed. You also see people, and this is what I did for a really long time, where they kind of, um, I'm trying to remember how I used to do it now, 
they they kind of collapse through their thoracic region so their arms are very unstable i really can't do it like i used to but they're very collapsed here they kind of look very bowed through their back and it's lots of weird stuff going on you've got to try and keep the spine poker straight and actually doing it in front of the camera like this or doing it by a mirror is really really helpful so your arms are very strong you're driving into the floor with your hands pushing away with your hands but really keeping strong through your shoulders there's no collapsing through the shoulders and you're watching for that pelvis so that was I, just a minute ago i wasn't doing it properly through my pelvis so there's too many there's too many things this is why i don't give it to people because it's a really hard exercise so i'm going to run through it again we're aiming for you to have your feet flat on the floor and for you to have your knees straight but those are the least important aspects of this exercise the most important aspects of the exercise is that you are straight through your spine and that your pelvis is an extension so don't worry about the other stuff, that will come. You need to keep trying to push for it, but don't push for it at the expense of what your pelvis is doing, because the pelvis is the key thing here. So I'm gonna do that again. I'm rolling that arch in my lower back, and I'm gonna try and keep that sensation at my pelvis going throughout the whole exercise. I'm pushing up and away with my hands. Notice that I've still got that little arch in my lower back. I'm finding the point at which I think I lose the arch in my lower back, which is maybe about there. So if I try and straighten my legs anymore, I start sort of humping, so I don't want to do that. So I'm keeping my tailbone super, super high. My spine is nice and straight. I'm keeping myself here. And then I'm going to count myself down for a minute and try and squeeze my quads and straighten my knees. So I'm kind of fighting, but I'm not straightening my knees at the expense of this happening, okay? So you've really got to keep that pelvis high in the air. And I'm going to count us down for a minute. So 60, 59, 58, squeeze the quads to relax the knees down, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 41, 40, 39. Oh, I'm going to reset again because I feel like I'm losing it slightly. So I'm bending my knees, rolling the arch of my back, kind of kicking my bum high in the air and starting it again. 30, 29, 28, 27. There's a lot of wobbling going on. 26. When downward dog is done, bleh, when downward dog is done properly, there's a lot of wobbling and releasing. This is not a static, easy posture. It's easy if you do this. It's not easy if you're actually keeping your pelvis in extension. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. I'm nearly getting to the floor. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Whew, it's a toughie and that's downward dog. Exercise number four on the um, condition two menu is runner stretch. So for runner stretch I thoroughly thoroughly recommend that you've got something to bend over to put your hands on because this is actually a really difficult exercise and most people end up compensating through their pelvis when they do this which means that they don't quite get the full action of what we want to occur at the pelvis in this exercise. So you're going to um, face something a bit like this, and you are going to have one knee directly behind the back of the ankle of the of another foot. That doesn't make any sense. You've got one foot directly in front of the knee like this. You can see I've got my toes tucked under on that bottom foot, and I'm in a nice straight line. So it's like I'm on a tightrope from my front toe all the way to my back toe. I'm keeping my feet straight and I'm keeping my knees straight. And then what I'm going to try and do here is roll a bit of an arch forward in my lower back. So can you see that there's a little bit of a dip in my lower back? That's me putting my pelvis in extension. As we go through this exercise, you'll probably notice that your pelvis wants to like slip under like this, which stops us from extending our pelvis properly as we want. So I want you to try and keep your pelvis in this position as you straighten your legs and actually don't straighten your legs 
over keeping your pelvis the same. So I would rather you keep the pelvic position as it is rather than have your legs straight. So what we're going to do is we're just standing up, watching that my pelvis doesn't lose that arch in the back. And you can see that my front leg is a bit stiff because it can't bend fully, but that's okay. It's better that I have that bend in my knee than have the leg straight and lose the pelvic position. So roll that arch in your back. You'll feel much more of a stretch in your hamstring. You're making sure when you look down at your feet that they are straight and that the back foot isn't kind of facing off in some random direction. You're going to squeeze your quads, your thigh muscles. Keep trying to roll that pelvis forward as you squeeze your thighs and then you're trying to straighten the legs without allowing that pelvis to sort of tip back and with the arch in your back. So I'm going to keep squeezing and I'm going to count us down for a minute on each side. So 60, 59, 58, I'm watching that my hips are facing straight ahead as well. They're not twisting from side to side. 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51. Squeezing my quads, really trying to wake up the front of my thighs to relax off the back of my pelvis. 49, I might have lost my pelvic position there slightly. So I'm kind of bending my knee again, rolling back into it and making sure that I'm stretching the leg without sacrificing the pelvic position. 40, 39, 38, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Brilliant. And then we're going to swap sides. So I'm just going to do it this way for good luck, but there's no need for you to swap around. So this time, you take the other foot in front of the other knee, tuck those toes under, make sure everything is in a nice straight line and that the feet aren't facing out to the side. And off we go again. And we're really trying to make sure that our hips, our car headlamps, stay facing forwards. They don't start twisting from side to side. So remember, keep those knees as bent as you need. The intention is that eventually you're going to be able to get those knees straight but we don't want your knees straight at the expense of that pelvis rocking back and under. It's gonna feel a lot more intense if you keep the pelvis in the position that I want you to. So, and again, so we're lifting up. Actually, no, I'm gonna walk you through that again. So roll the pelvis forward so you've got the arch in your back. Lift yourself up. And don't just hurry to straighten the leg because you might lose that pelvic position. So keep the knee bent. Hips are staying straight ahead, squeezing those quads, still trying to roll the arch into your lower back, pinning down through your big toes, and over the course of the minute, hopefully you're gonna get that right leg, in my instance, a bit straighter. So off we go, so 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40. Keep squeezing those quads. This is about you squeezing the quads and that's gonna start changing how the hamstrings interact. 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, so I've straightened my leg now nice and slowly. I didn't rush it. 27, 26, 25, 24, 23. And I've still got that nice flat back and flat pelvis. I'm not arching like this, sort of humping through. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, Seven, keep trying to roll that arch in your lower back. Six, five, four, three, two, one. 
There we go. So that was runner stretch, but it was modified because in my opinion, no one does that properly unless they've got that prop there. Um, so I don't demonstrate the non propped up version. Exercise number five in the condition two menu is frog. So a little bit more gentle than some of the exercises in the menu. And I'm sorry, you're getting the true reality of life with my cat. She likes to, um, get very involved with the videos that I make. So for frog, you're going to come and lie on your back. You're going to take the soles of your feet together. So you're really trying to make sure that you've got your big toe joint, your fifth toe joint and your heel together. And you're just allowing your knees to hang open nice and wide. And you are just relaxing in this position, palms facing up for two minutes. So I love this one. I'm definitely going to do this for the full two minutes. In this exercise, do not be tempted to fiddle around with your pelvis and lower back position. There should be a little bit of an arch in your lower back. So because of the weight of your knees, it's kind of hoiking you forward through your pelvis and it's encouraging a little bit of extra pelvic and lumbar extension. Don't be tempted to kind of smush this back onto the floor to flatten it out. But equally, if this is hurting you, maybe don't continue to do the exercise. So we're gonna lie here, I'm gonna count us down another, we'll do a hundred counts, hundred. <laughs> I'm gonna count us down from a hundred. So a hundred, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, 94, cats attacking the carpet, 93, 92, 91, just completely relax in this, 90, 89, 87, 86, 66, 65, 64, 63, 62, 61, 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That is frog. And hopefully you'll feel quite relaxed at the end of that one, but it might depend on how tight your hips are. Exercise number six of the condition two menu is supine groin stretch. So supine groin stretch is a, not a complicated one. It's how long is a piece of string one. So there is no way of telling you how long you need to do this for, because it's about how your body reacts and how your body feels in the exercise. So for supine groin stretch, you are going to need a thing like this, which might be a bed, it might be a chair. You just need something where you're going to put one leg over the top of this. And you're also going to need something like a heavy book or a kind of firm yoga block, it's a heavy yoga block, which is going to prop your foot in place and it's going to stop it from flopping out to the side. So for supine groin stretch, we are doing this. And I'm just going to make sure that my foot is in the picture so you can see. So I'm going to be lying on my back like so. I'll get the yoga block involved in a second. 
and literally just lying with my palms facing up in this position. But what you will find is, is that when your body is fully relaxed, this extended leg here flops out to the side because it's not being sort of held up. We don't want you to be waking up any muscles. There shouldn't be any muscular tension through your body at this stage. So what we want you to do is I want you to use a block to hold your ankle in place so that the foot doesn't fall out to the side. So you are lying back on the floor with that foot propped up against something that you, when you're fully relaxed, the foot is not falling to the side, it's facing to the ceiling. Sorry, we've got more cat-based cat hell. Oh, they're having a fight now, that's great. Um, so this leg is propped up and relaxed on the floor, palms facing up, other leg up over the block or the chair, whatever you've got. This thing needs to be high enough so that when you relax everything off, your foot and your knee also don't collapse to the side when they're on the block. So you are lying in this position, you've got one hip in extension and you've got one hip in flexion. No muscles in your body are working, but you've got that block holding your leg in place, which is gonna help you relax off this hip more. And the supine groin stretch, everyone's going to feel different here. And this is why it's a bit like, how long is a piece of string? You basically need to lie on this in both sides of your body for as long as you need until you feel that without you having to do anything, your back is fully flat on the ground. So this is not about you pushing your back onto the ground and rocking that pelvis backwards because that's not your body's like natural resting position. That's you forcing the movement to happen. You need to lie here for potentially half an hour on each leg, possibly even longer, until you feel that actually if I rock my pelvis backwards, there is no movement left any longer in my lower back. So whilst I'm doing this, I don't think I'm that far off having my back flat on the floor, but there is a little bit of movement there. So if I rock my pelvis backwards, there is a little bit of a movement through my lower back. So I'm not quite there yet. So I might potentially lie here for another five to 10 minutes on this side. And then when I rock my pelvis backwards, I would hopefully think, ah, oh, you know what? There's no movement there anymore. My back is fully flat. I've completely relaxed off this hip flexor that's extended. That's what that's telling you. And then I can swap sides and do the other side. If we are tight in our hip flexors and our hip flexors kind of just don't stretch out and extend properly, because they attach here, what they do, and if they're tight, they hoik you forward and create this arch in your back. So this exercise is very much about trying to relax off the hip flexor, release off your lower back, but it's not done through you doing any work. It's done through time, gravity, your body weight, and this passive release, which is supine groin stretch. So this is a great one for anyone with super, super tight hips to do, but it might take a really long time. So if you're very, very tight and aggravated in your pelvis, and you've got this real cranking forwards through your pelvis, as I said earlier, you might need to lie here for potentially like 45 minutes on one side before your back feels like it's fully flat on the floor and you can swap sides. And actually now, now just being here a bit longer, I don't have any movement anymore in my lower back, so I could swap sides, but I'm not going to do that because that wouldn't be a very exciting video. So this is supine groin stretch. I can't tell you how long you need. It could be five minutes each leg. It could be 45 minutes on each leg. But this is something that's really worthwhile doing a number of times a week because it's just stretching off that hip one side at a time and it will be de-chairing you in a hopefully fairly manageable way. This is walking you through standing quad stretch. So for standing quad stretch, you're going to need something a bit like this. Now, that's not very helpful, but this really depends on how well you can perform this exercise. So I'm going to do the exercise and trying to explain to you as best I can as to what kind of height you need. I'm going after the side of this chair. I could probably go higher than this, um, but it's best to start off low and then kind of figure out whereabouts you're at. So standing quad stretch, you're going to hold for up to a minute on either side. Again, as ever, working with your body. It might be 30 seconds. It might be 45 seconds the next week. It might be a minute after that. I've got the chair kind of close to a wall so I can put my hand out to balance if I need to. And what we're doing is I'm gonna stand, and this is a bit of sort of trial and error, like I said, because you'll get yourself set up and then you might have to kind of correct things slightly. So standing with my legs straight, 
hips are over my ankles. I'm not doing this. I'm not bending my knees. I'm trying to keep my legs nice and straight as I do this. And I'm going to hold the ball if I need to for support. But I'm looking to keep my hips in alignment with each other. So you might notice here that your hips, as we do this, want to kind of rotate and twist from side to side. You are keeping them straight ahead. And really, you're trying not to... Well, you might have a little bit of wobbling into place as you get yourself into the stretch, but then you're going to try and realign yourself. You also want it to be that your foot that stays on the floor, again, this will make sense in a second, doesn't move or react. So basically, this is what the exercise is going to look like in general. We've got some more things coming up very shortly. But as you put the one leg up, the standing foot should not shuffle or move out of place. So keep that foot really firmly facing straight ahead with the big toe down on the ground. Now, the next thing that you're looking for is you want to have your hip, hips on both sides and your knees on both sides in alignment with one another. So can you see here that my right knee is further forward than my left? So I'm going to kind of hop myself forward slightly so that I put my right knee in alignment with my left knee, and therefore my hips are also going to be in alignment. And then what I'm doing is I'm just holding this for a minute, but at the same time, I'm actually tucking under in my pelvis. So you might find here that you really want to create a big arch in your lower back, and you're trying to tuck under. So this is where this kind of trial and error over height comes in. Because if you go too ambitiously high, so for example, if I was to decide that I'm gonna go for the back of this chair, which might be possible for some people, I don't think it is for me, but I'm gonna give it a go. Oh, actually, you know what, I probably can do it. So I'm gonna do this, because actually this feels better for me. You're looking to feel a stretch in your quad at whatever height you're at. So you might be more like that initial height that my body was at, but actually this does feel quite good for me to do this. So I can still stand here with the foot flat on the floor, facing straight ahead, big toe down. My hips are even from side to side, so one side of my pelvis is not twisting forward. My knees are even from side to side. I feel the stretch in my quad, and the last bit of the exercise is I'm trying to tuck under in my pelvis. So I'm not really arching forward here in my back, which might happen if you go too high with the thing that you are balancing on. So I'm gonna count us down 45 seconds here. But as I said, you can work towards a minute. Try and keep yourself as steady as possible. And it's really all about that hip area around here, stretching up, trying to keep the knees level with each other. But that doesn't mean touching, it means level out of the hip joint. So off we go, tucking under in that pelvis posteriorly. 45. 44, 42, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, this is a lovely stretch for me, this is when I need to do more of, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. Remember, you're really tucking under the pelvis. That's the active bit of this stretch. Four, three, two, one. We'll swap sides and I'll just try and explain that. So never in a Gosky method do you have, and actually I'm going to start off on that lower level to start with just to make sure that I'm uh, not being too ambitious. So very rarely in a Gosky method are there exercises where you're ever being static. There is always a part of your body, in this case it's that tucking under the pelvis, which is an active movement which is changing the configuration of the muscles in the intended area. If you're just in, for example, in this exercise, if you were just standing like this and kind of relaxing into it and just holding it there, it's static, it's pointless. We're trying to drive action into muscles. So let's set ourselves back up again. And I'm gonna have to jump this leg a bit forward so that it's nice and aligned, nice. This is where we're setting ourselves up. My knees and hips are in alignment, but I suspect I'm gonna find this harder this side because my left side is my slightly more dodgy area and we're tucking under in the hips. 
This is too low for me because actually I'm not feeling a stretch in my like thighs or hips at all, but this might be exactly where your body needs. So just work within the limits of your body and adjust it accordingly. So I'm gonna go up to the higher height. I'll be surprised if I can do this, this side, because uh, my left side is my tighter side. So yeah, you can see here that my left hip is, sorry, my left knee is much further behind my right hip. So can I adjust myself? This is a very elegant thing, there we go. So they're nicely in alignment now. The, the leg is under, sorry, the leg is on the top. I'm rolling under through my pelvis, creating more of a posterior pelvic tilt, but that gets the stretch of the hip and we're holding. So you've got to keep that action there in the pelvis, otherwise it's a static stretch. And you mustn't also hyperextend the standing knee. So some of you might be very tempted to kind of buckle backwards in the standing knee. So just try and keep it loose, but that doesn't mean bent. So you want that straight line from hip, knee, ankle. This isn't a straight line. That's not a straight line. You're really trying to keep in that kind of middle ground between hyperextension and flexion. 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40. 39, keep the knees and the hips straight from that front view. 38, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And you might want to have a little walk around afterwards, but that's standing quad stretch. Exercise number eight on the condition two menu is called abdominals. So this exercise doesn't really exist in this format anymore on our software, um, but we would normally call this abdominal crunches now. Um, maybe like flexion abdominal, abdominal crunches is the most similar exercise on the software to what was in the book from 1993. So abdominals, as the name suggests, is really working the abdominals. And what we're looking for is you're going to assume this type of position against the wall. You're making sure that your knees are at a 90 degree angle against the wall. Your feet are parallel facing up to the ceiling, so they're not kind of poking out to the side like that or pigeon toed. They are staying nice and straight. The knees stay directly out of the hip and you are trying to keep your legs as relaxed as possible, but don't let them move too much as we go through this exercise. So you might notice that your knees kind of want to wobble or you want to adjust your feet and you're really trying to keep everything here sort of relaxed, but also steady at the same time. What you're going to do is put your hands behind your head like so and squeeze your elbows down to the floor. So you can see that my elbows are level with my ears. We are going to do very gentle little crunches. We're going to do two sets of 25 and we are using our abdominals, our stomach muscles to pull us up literally like two or three inches. Our neck stays relaxed and it stays kind of, our head stays heavy on our hands. Our shoulders are squeezed back and down away from our ears. And what we are not doing are sit-ups a bit like this. So there is no curving through our spine or hoiking through our hands to drag our head up because what this is doing is building strength into a thoracic, sorry, into thoracic flexion. So basically more of a hunchback. If we do more of this type of stuff, we're building strength into a compensation that most people already have. We don't want that, sorry, this function that most people already have. So what you're doing is really trying to keep your upper spine very, very straight here and you're using the abdominals to drag you up just a couple of inches at a time. Your eyes stay facing upwards the whole time. They should not start looking forwards. So if they start looking forwards, you are likely pulling with your hands. So back and down with your, um, with your shoulder blades, keeping them far away from your ears and keeping your elbows level with your ears. I'm going to do some very gentle little crunches using my abdominal muscles. So off we go. So we're going like this. 
one. Notice how my elbows don't come further forward than my um, ears. My neck is completely not tense. All the work is happening in my abdominals and I'm not going up too high. And I'm looking at the ceiling throughout. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You might find that you need to reset yourself quite a few times here because you desperately want to take over with your elbows or with your neck. So if that's the case, just stop, take a minute or do less reps, but just make sure that you're not starting to curl up through that upper back. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, there's no tension in my neck, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Good, shake off the hands, give yourself a little bit of a wiggle and then we're going to do another set of 25 reps. So this is a very good exercise for me to do because I am a big rib cage flare. When I start moving my shoulders, my rib cage really wants to flare. So this, by working the abdominals whilst the shoulders are back and down behind me, is building more strength into this like strength here in the front of my body. Um, not everyone is that type of posture. So like not everyone is a rib cage flarer, but I am a rib cage flarer. So this very much flare, flare, so it very much suits me. So off we go again, making sure that those knees are perhaps so the feet are parallel facing up to the ceiling. The knees are directly out of the hips. You're squeezing your arms behind you, keeping the elbows level with the ears, eyes up to the ceiling, just a couple of inches, and it's the abdominals dragging you up, nothing else. Off we go, another 25 reps. One, neck stays relaxed. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And relaxing off, and that is abdominals. Exercise number nine on the condition two menu is our old favorite foot circles. So most people are inherently weak in their feet and in their ankles. And I give this exercise to almost all of my clients because I'm yet to meet anybody who has got feet that are actually capable of carrying their body. So this is just a really good way of just getting some strength back into the foundations of your body. We're going to have one leg outstretched in front. One leg we're going to hold behind the thigh here. You're trying to keep your upper body and your shoulders relaxed. So don't feel like you're kind of hunching off off the floor as you do this. The leg that is outstretched stays very active at the ankle. So 90 degrees at the ankle throughout and push your calf onto the floor throughout. So you might notice, here we go. Here she is. She's making her appearance. Come here. So you might notice with your leg that it wants to get a bit floppy and raise off the floor. So you want to try and keep on getting licked a lot in my head. So you want to keep that leg very flat on the floor and active. And this is going to stretch off that hip of the extended leg. With this leg, we are going to try and move from our ankle only. And the way that we're going to ensure that we're only moving from our ankle is by trying to keep our shin completely still. So we are not bouncing around from the knee and moving the shin. We are trying to get the articulation occurring at the ankle. So very active in the extended leg and nice and nice big circles from this foot of the raised leg. Shoulders relaxed and shoulders kind of back and down behind you. We're going to do 40 reps one direction, 40 reps the other direction, and then 40 points and flexes. 
you might not be able to do 40 and that's fine work towards 20 work towards 30 work towards whatever works for you but as time goes on you want to try and be increasing those reps so off we go so nice and deliberately don't rush this get this occurring at the ankle not the shin bobbing around manically three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine thirty thirty one thirty two thirty three thirty four thirty five thirty six thirty seven thirty eight thirty nine forty other way you'll notice that my other foot is staying very rigid it's facing towards the ceiling calf is pinned on the floor for five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine thirty 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Point and flex like a ballerina. Still trying to keep that shin as still as you can. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Good job. Did your foot stay active at that 90 degrees throughout the exercise and keeping that shin Sorry, keeping that calf pinned on the floor on the extended leg. And off we go on the other side. So 30, sorry, <laughs> what am I doing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Other way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Point and flex. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Is your other foot still active? Is the shin on the floor? 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. That's probably my client's least favourite exercise because it highlights how weak we all are in our feet. So we've got to do it more. Exercise number 10 in the condition two routine from the Agoski method of health through motion is crocodile. So in the book it's called crocodile twist but nowadays it's called um, simply crocodile. Um, and again this is one of my favourite moves because I love anything that's a big twist. I think I'm a condition two person, so therefore anything that's rotatory, rotatey, don't know, don't know if that's a word, um, it just feels really, really good for me. So we've got quite a few things to make sure that we're doing correctly here. So pause the video, 
make sure you're doing things properly, make sure you're feeling it as I want you to, and just listen to all the cues carefully. So for crocodile or crocodile twist, you're going to extend your legs out long and you're going to have your hands palms down on the floor. You want to try and keep your hands active and sort of pushing down on the floor throughout this exercise. You also want to try and get your shoulder blades back and down behind you and sort of on the floor as well. So when we continue through this exercise, you might notice that your hands do, I call it pyramid. You might notice that your hands pyramid up and you might notice that your shoulder blades kind of roll up and away from the floor. We are trying to keep them pinned down because it's gonna work all the muscles along the back of your arms and into your upper back as well. So pushing down on the floor gently with your hands and trying to keep the shoulder blades back and down away from your ears. You are going to dorsiflex your feet. So you can see here that my toes are facing up to the ceiling and I've got an active 90 degree angle at my ankles. This is dorsiflexion. We are keeping dorsiflexion in this, we are keeping dorsiflex throughout this whole exercise. So this is probably going to be the bit of your body that wants to desperately get, get floppy. And that's because in my opinion, people's feet are often the weakest part of their whole body. So it's the bit of the body that doesn't want to stay switched on. We want you to force your feet to stay on because it changes what happens throughout the whole of your leg. So keeping that action through your arms, through your hands and through your shoulders, you are going to stack the Achilles heel in between the big toe and the second toe of the other heel. So you can see here that I've got my left leg on top of my right leg. And keeping my shoulders and my hands pinned on the floor, keeping my ankles active, I am going to twist my body towards the right hand side. So because my left hand leg is on top, I'm twisting towards the right hand side. And I'm holding this at whatever point that I can, keeping my feet active, keeping my hands and my shoulders on the ground, my knees are straight and I'm squeezing my glutes, I'm squeezing my quad and I'm, my quads, my thigh muscles, and I'm facing my head in the opposite direction. So I'm just gonna run through that again, but you can see that my knees are straight, there's no bend in my knees as I do this, knees are straight, I'm squeezing with my quads and I'm squeezing with my glutes whilst my hands are pinned on the floor. Do not go all the way over with your lower body if it means that the upper body starts like rolling up and compensating. So just work within your limits and listen to your body. So I'll run through that again. Palms facing down, pushing into the floor, shoulders stay away from the ears. Ankles are active in dorsiflexion. I'm putting my left um, Achilles heel in between my right big toe and right second toe. My knees stay straight. I'm squeezing my quads, my thigh muscles. I'm squeezing my glutes and then I'm rolling towards the right hand side, keeping the ankles active, keeping the knees straight, keeping the quads switched on and keeping the glutes switched on. And I'm turning my head in the opposite direction, pinning down through my hands and counting down from 60. So 60, 59, 58, 57, 56. And I keep, I'm keeping all of those cues um, in mind and I'm really keeping my whole body active, but I'm still trying to rotate over uh, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34. Keep the ankles active, knees straight, quads and glutes on. Keep twisting, keep the hands down. I don't know where we are counting wise. 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Relaxing off, and we're gonna swap sides. So once again, palms facing down, squeezing into the floor with your hands, squeezing into the floor with your shoulders, waking up the ankles, keeping them dorsiflex. I'm putting my right Achilles heel in between my left big toe and my left second toe. My knees are straight, my ankles are flexed, I'm squeezing my quads, I'm squeezing my glutes, and I'm twisting as far as I can, keeping all of those things switching on and trying to rotate as much as possible. 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 
50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36. Can you see there that my um, right hand really wants to pyramid up? I don't know if you saw that, so I've really got to try and squish down my right wrist. Uh, I don't know where we are counting wise, this is bad. 25, 24, 23, my right hand really wants to cheat. 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, I'm gonna push that shoulder down on the right hand side to stop me from cheating. 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, four, three, two, one. Great. So that's crocodile and that should make you feel like you're a towel that's been really, really thoroughly wringed out. Exercise number 11 in the condition uh, two menu is pelvic tilts. So we're going to do 20 pelvic tilts and they seem like a very easy exercise, but actually they can be surprisingly hard and the reason is, is it's very easy for certain muscles to kind of take over and compensate in this area so you're looking for what is really driving this movement and that will hopefully make a bit more sense as we go through it you're coming to what we call the hook lying position so you've got your knees bent and you've got your feet flat on the floor when you look down at your legs are your hips your knees and your feet are in a nice straight line or are your knees hanging wide or your knees kind of coming together? You want to make sure that there's a nice straight line from hip all the way down to your big toe through the leg. And what you're going to be doing is you're not lifting your bottom off the floor here, but you're rolling your pelvis backwards so that you've got a flat lower back on the floor. And then you're rolling your pelvis forward. We're about to get another cat, I think, coming into view. They're all, they're all here today. You're gonna roll the pelvis forwards so that you get an arch in your lower back. So we are just rocking posteriorly, that's pelvic flexion, and anteriorly, and that's pelvic extension. So anterior pelvic tilt, pelvic extension, and posterior pelvic tilt, pelvic flexion. You're rocking through this for me. You're trying to keep your knees steady and your feet flat on the floor. The movement is just happening at your pelvis. And if things were working, as we would want them to, you should not feel like this is your abdominals, your tummy muscles, like really leading this movement. It should feel like the pelvis is sort of moving itself. And I never quite know how to describe that, but I get lots of people that describe to me that they feel very kind of like tense around their abdominals and kind of lower back and stuff as they're doing this. And the muscles of the lower back are working, but I like to try and direct people to think about their hip flexors, which are more in their groin. Think of the hip flexors as sort of pulling you down and the lower back as pulling you backwards. I really don't know if that makes sense, but just your abdominals should not be working here. This is just a kind of gentle pelvic movement and you're trying not to rush it and you're just trying to get as much range of movement as you can. So how flat can you get onto, the, onto your back, onto the floor without lifting up your bottom? And then how far forward can you roll an arch in your lower back without there being any tension? You've just got to work with the limits of your body. I'm going to do another 10 of these, but I've probably done way more than 20, but just for the, because I was talking so much, I'll do 10 more. So 10, nine, nice and slow, range of movement, much more important than speed. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That is pelvic tilts. Okay, exercise number 12 on the condition two menu. I'm sorry, my house has just turned into sheer and utter cat chaos, but I've given up trying to control them anymore. So we'll have to just bear with the cats that will always be here. So we've got exercise number 12 and the condition two menu is upper spinal floor twists. And this is genuinely, I think one of my favorite Agoski moves. I love this exercise. It definitely serves me well. So for upper spinal floor twists, what we are doing is we are coming to a fetal position on our side like so. 
and you are watching that your knees stay stacked together, <laughs> stay stacked together throughout this exercise. So you will probably notice when you're doing this that your top knee wants to drift back and away from the bottom knee. You've really got to make sure that the knees are directly on top of each other throughout this exercise because that means that your pelvis is staying steady and we're getting the work happening where we want it to in your upper back rather than the pelvis compensating so that we're not getting the stretch through the thoracic spine as we intend to. So this is all about the upper back getting stretched off basically. We're trying to differentiate the movement of the rib cage and the upper spine to be different to the pelvis. You've got this very versatile, flexible spine, but lots of people are just very, very locked up in their spine. So you're going to be in this type of position. I've got my hands together like I'm gonna dive off a diving board. I'm gonna have my head on the floor. If you can't have your head on the floor comfortably, put it on a block or a pillow. Don't have your head held and tense here because you're going to then put like pressure into your neck and you'll probably set off some neck pain, which is not what we want. So arms out to the side. You can hold this like genuinely for as long as feels good. I'm going to do this for a minute on either side, but feel free to do this for two or even three minutes on side to side if it feels really good for you. So arms out to the side, knees together. I am taking my top arm over the top and you'll see there that I'm taking that straight over above my shoulder, not like this and not like this. So you might notice that your arm wants to kind of circle around like that, or you might notice that it might want to sort of circle that way. We are trying to get this very big stretch here at the top of that shoulder. So don't let your arm scooch around either way. That's a bit of a compensation. So head on the floor, relax, arm over the top, Hand, if you want to, that's staying on the floor, can hold your legs together and just make sure that you feel like you're pushing that top knee forward so that it doesn't slide back. And then we're going to actively lever ourselves open, taking our head in the same direction, and we're aiming to get our hand, our elbow, and our shoulders onto the floor over the course of the minute, but not at the expense of this knee. So you will feel how easy this is to achieve. If you allow that knee to slip, very, very easy hand on floor. It's much more difficult when you're trying to actually get the work occurring at the thoracic spine. So over we go. I'm going to count us down a minute, but feel free to hold for longer if you want. So 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42. Keep pushing that top knee forwards. Don't let it slip back. It doesn't matter if the shoulder doesn't touch the floor. What does matter is if you are compensating through your pelvis. So keep the knees stacked. 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Fab, that's one side. I'm going to do the other side facing this way so that my head turns towards the camera so you can see what it looks like from both different angles. So you're changing sides, arms are out in front of you like you're diving off a diving board, head is either relaxed on the floor or it's on a block, it's not tense through the neck, making sure the knees are stacked one on top of the other and the top leg doesn't drift backwards at all. You're taking your arm over the top, trying to touch the floor but not trying to touch the floor at the expense of your knees, holding those knees together taking the arm in the direction. There are too many cats in my house. And then we're gonna count down to from 60. So 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51. Keep pushing forward with that top knee. 49, 48, my counting's terrible. 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 
37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32. I'm always checking my knees to see if they've drifted. I'm always readjusting. Remember, it doesn't matter if your arm doesn't touch the floor. Your arm might be up here and that's fine as long as you're not letting the knees cheat. 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25. Try and breathe deeply in this one. Try and kind of open your chest as much as you can and allow your breath to settle the muscles off. 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And just gently come out of that one because sometimes it can almost feel like you're a bit winded because it's such a deep stretch here. Well, for me anyway, this is how it feels. I get a stretch all the way up my kind of mid back up to my rib cage. And that's because that's where my hip flexors attached. So your hip flexors go from all the way back here down into the groin. So when you're opening your rib cage and kind of mobilizing it like that, you're not only stretching your shoulders and your spine, but you're also stretching off your hips as well. The last exercise in the condition three, oh sorry, the condition two menu is air bench. So air bench comes up a lot. It's a great exercise because it's putting the work back into the legs when oftentimes it gets put really aggressively into people's hip flexors and they kind of overwork there or into the lower back. So we're trying to put the work into our big, strong leg muscles. You are making sure that we're basically going to be in this kind of seated position against the wall, but you're making sure that your feet are further away from the wall than your knees are. So you want to slide down the wall and you're looking to have your knees a little bit closer to you than your ankles are. You can also see here that I've got my feet parallel facing straight ahead. They're not facing out to the side and that my knees and my ankles are directly out of my hips. I'm not allowing my knees to collapse in or to fall out. I'm grounding down into the floor with my feet, which is sort of pushing back through my quads. And it's mainly the quads that are going to feel the work here. At the same time, you're trying to push your lower back into the wall using this strength through your feet and through your legs so that there's no arch in your lower back. This is a great exercise for removing rotation as well as putting the work back into the legs. You can do this for up to three minutes. I would normally get most of my clients doing this for two minutes or working towards two minutes, but I'm just gonna count down for 60 seconds now. So 60, upper body stays relaxed, like relax your hands, really pushing into the floor with your feet and feeling the work in the quads. 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, making sure the knees stay directly out of the hips, they don't drift in and out. 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45, 44, 43, 42, 41, 40, 39, 38, 37, 36, 35, 34, 33, 32, 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 20 30, oh, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, three, two, one. And just gently push yourself off the wall like so and have a little walk around. And that's air bench. And that's the last exercise on the condition two routine from the Agoski method of health through motion book. So there you have it. That was our condition two menu from the Agoski method of health through motion book by Pete Agoski. We had 13 exercises today. Some of them were pretty hard. As I said at the beginning, give them a go, listen to your body, and if they don't feel right, don't carry on doing them. I'm sorry that there was so much uh, cat involvement today. It is what it is. I can't argue with my cats. I have to do what they say because they rule the roost. 
in my house. I hope you enjoyed this and if you have any questions or comments please do leave them in the comments below. Bye!